My name is uh, uh, Steve Spielberg, and I just directed a movie called uh, Jaws, and Jaws is about to uh, be nominated in 11 categories. You're about to see us sweep the nominations. We're very confident at this very moment, and uh, so if we, you all have a seat, uh, we'll get on with it. The purpose of this video is different than my typical ones. This isn't intended to be either a whimsical or comprehensive breakdown of the film, but rather to examine this early example of Steven Spielberg's work, especially in light of its context. Jaws is the first of the four films that Spielberg released in what I'd consider to be his greatest period. With the exception of the film 1941, these four films, Jaws, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Raiders of the Lost Ark and E.T. are all giants of cinema, and all released within a seven-year period. That's not to say that Schindler's List or Jurassic Park aren't important, but those are the works of a man nearly 20 years separated from Jaws, a man whose name was synonymous with great films already when he made them. This is the period when he was devoted exclusively to popular works, adventure, science fiction, suspense in a period when those things were few and far between. It was after E.T. that his films, save for the Indiana Jones pictures that he had promised to do for George Lucas, moved away from that towards more period pieces. Spielberg was already creating art, but he was not being recognized as an artist as far as accolades go. As I've discussed before, his ability to draw a nuanced performance out of a three-year-old child demonstrates one aspect of his skill. We'll see more as we look at this classic film. And think about that for a moment. Jaws, a film about a man-eating shark, is called a classic film. Who could have imagined before that a film with so schlock of a concept would go down as one of the greatest films in history? Yet today, on the 45th anniversary of its release, that is nevertheless the case. The film opens with the famous, simple yet effective theme shot from the shark POV, beginning the process of conditioning the audience to associate the, that sound with the shark, so that we know of its presence without seeing it. This is then immediately seen as Chrissy is seen from below, but not while swimming on the surface, only when she's treading water and the camera approaches to indicate the approach of the shark. Jaws isn't the first film to use this technique, obviously, though it should be noted how Spielberg avoids people looking into the camera, so that while we're seeing things from the shark point of view, we're not given the sense that we are the shark, because the moment the attack happens, this stops. The music is important. It warns of an approaching invisible thing, unstoppable, grisly death. After a brief introduction to Chief Brody and Normalcy, although even now his inability to imitate the local accent shows that he doesn't fit in, any attempt betrays his working-class background in contrast to the wealthy political and economic leadership of the island. This will come up soon as, after finding the remains of Chrissy and hearing the cause of death was a shark attack, Brody presumes the only response is to close the beaches to prevent further loss of life. That, after all, is his job. But when the civil leadership including the coroner who gave him the report and the editor of the local paper, confront him about going beyond his authority and his position as a newcomer rather than one of the islanders, as they're called, Brody is willing to acquiesce, especially when the coroner assures him that the change to boating accident will provide coverage for any concerns that Brody might have. And yet, in the very next scene when the family is at the beach, Brody can't stop staring at the water. Brody has a fear of the water, and so he watches it with suspicion, teetering between his instincts telling him that a propeller couldn't have done that, but also aware that it might just be him projecting his anxieties, since if he had even the slightest suspicion that his fears were real, that there was actually a deadly shark out there, he wouldn't allow his kids in the water. And yet, we are leading up to the second victim, who gets even less time than the first one did. 
After a brief conversation with his mom, Alex Kittner is just this kid out there kicking around on his inflatable. Spielberg's technique is to first build suspense by drawing out Brody's anxiety without any indication that he's not just, as his wife says, being uptight. It's the moment the dog is gone, without a trace, that the audience knows that the menace has finally arrived, and the time between the start of the music and the bloody attack on a child is seconds. Brody's realization, a reverse of the classic trombone shot employed in Vertigo, is so famous that it's taught in film schools as the Jaws shot. With undeniable proof that there's a man-eating shark in these waters, the city leadership and the business community are quick to meet to discuss the problem, but all too quickly it's clear they're as blind to this as the mayor had been. Even a dead child in front of a beach full of witnesses isn't enough to convince them when it's their livelihoods on the line. That's when Quint famously steps in, silencing the room without raising his voice just aptly using nails and a chalkboard and giving a monologue about dealing with the shark. He addresses the need for action to the assembled business leaders, but the plan of action he addresses to Brody as one working class man to another. He sees this is the person who's going to actually get something done. Quint is in a deleted scene that would have been earlier, but Spielberg wisely excised it. It's a good scene, but it allows Quint to appear with dramatic impact here and then to disappear for the rest of the first half of the film, save for a silent background image of him. Alex Kittner's mother has put up a $3,000 bounty on the shark, about $15,000 today, so a couple of local dipsticks decide that they are going to just do this like fishing. Use a roast for bait, a huge meat hook, an inner tube for a bobber, and a chain to secure the line to the pier. While they wait, Spielberg silently shows Brody continuing to look through a book on sharks to give us the reminder they're dealing with something that really exists, an actual creature that is capable of doing these things. Of course, our monster is capable of even more, as the two fishermen discover when the shark rips out the pier without effort and then circles back towards the one who's fallen in. As I said, little time was spent on either Chrissy or Alex before they died, So this, plus the fact the music establishes the shark is definitely there, adds great tension, even if they both manage to survive. Oh, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I wasn't nominated. I got beaten out by Fellini. The next day, while a bunch of -of out-of-state yahoos come to try to claim the shark bounty, Matt Hooper enters the picture, getting no respect from anyone, until he can finally corner Brody and properly introduce himself. It takes only the most preliminary examination to conclude the obvious, that this kind of damage is not going to be the result of a propeller, and throughout Hooper's questions, it keeps reminding Brody how he has failed at his job. He neither contacted the Coast Guard about a potentially dangerous predator, nor did he even make any effort to check the waters around the island himself. This importantly leads into an upcoming scene. The medical examination scene, incidentally, contains this awkward edit, surprising given that this film actually won an Oscar for editing. After chastising Brody, who is about to light up a cigarette, Hooper pulls the cadaver's severed arm up out of the tray for the audience to see, while saying, So this is what happens. And then in the next scene immediately says, It indicates the non-frenzied feeding of, and so on, with his line. There is no obvious indication of what it in his statement is referring to. So this line implies that Hooper said something about the attack in a scene that was removed. The film is rated PG. I know that's surprising, but according to legend, the producers argued that the MPAA only rated on sex, language, and violence. And since there's no sex or visible nudity, the language is not excessive, and the only aggressive action is either committed by or committed against an animal, it's technically not violence. But still, the idea that we might have had some even more grisly stuff in the scene that hastened a quick edit would certainly not be surprising. However, it is just an awkward insert shot. Spielberg wanted the audience to see even more of what the shark had done to that poor girl. After all, Everything aside of blood has so far merely been implied, and since there's no dialogue, they just had to edit in a line from Hooper's from somewhere else 
so that wasn't just stop so we can look at a grisly half-eaten arm. If you actually remove this scene from the film, Hooper's dialogue then makes complete sense. He describes the extent of the injuries, rebukes Brody, and then says it indicates the non-frenzied freeding, the it now clearly meaning the injuries that he had just made note of. I'd play the edited version for you, but YouTube won't let me, so you'll just have to check it out for yourself or take my word for it. Hooper's dictating is also important for our purposes. First, he repeatedly uses the term squalus to refer to a shark. And while that is the Latin word for a shark, that's not the term that scientists would use. In fact, it can be confused with a specific genus called squalus. Second, he suggests that this could possibly be the work of Longimanus or Isurus Glaucus, the former being a reference to the oceanic white tip and the latter to the short fin mako. Except both of those have a problem. The mako, first off, is being identified with a long outdated taxonomical name for it. And second, this mako lives in the Pacific Ocean, so it would be a dubious suspect for a New England attack. The white tip is believed to be one of the worst sharks to deal with because they live out in the open ocean and so are likely the ones to attack if a ship or a plane were to go down. But they prefer the deep ocean areas, even though they live near the surface, and so would be highly unlikely to come to shore. Yes, it has happened in extremely rare situations, but even then the water wasn't anywhere near as cold as it is in New England. Spielberg wants to establish that Hooper is a scientist and his words should be treated as fact, even though what he says is something no expert would actually say. I don't bring this up to nitpick the film. Rather, I'm bringing it up because it's going to be important to future discussions about Spielberg's films. The mob, despite the best efforts of Darwin, have succeeded in bringing in a big tiger shark, a reasonable suspect because the three most common killer sharks, when we know that a shark is responsible, are the bull shark, the tiger shark, and the great white shark. Since they're big, they swim where humans swim, and their teeth are made to shear rather than to grab like other sharks, so they deal so much damage that even if they don't eat you, you're likely mortally wounded in the process. While everyone seems happy that the nightmare is over, especially Brody, Hooper makes the point that the shape of this shark's mouth doesn't match the bite marks on the body that he just examined and he'd like to cut the shark open to confirm that this is the shark that ate Alex Kittner, which Vaughn is aghast at. The point should be made, though, that his objection isn't that he wants a cover-up. He doesn't like the idea purely on the grounds of good taste. Brody could no doubt force this issue, but that's when Mrs. Kittner arrives and slaps him, holding him personally responsible in a quiet monologue, unable to believe that her child could die this horrible death when the people charged with keeping him safe knew about the threat. But now it's too late. As she says, My boy is dead now, and there's nothing you can do about it. This defines Brody's journey for the film. It's a story of guilt. No matter how this film ends, she's right. There is nothing that Brody can do to undo what's happened. All he can try to do is ensure that it doesn't happen again and find a way to live with it. Spielberg doesn't allow Brody any wiggle room either. When Mayor Vaughn tries to assure Brody that she's wrong, Brody will not accept absolution. Even though he was the one least in favor of dropping the matter, he did in the end allow himself to be cowed into inaction. We can understand why he feels that way. In a scene a little later on, while drunk, he laments being a cop in New York. You feel like you accomplished nothing. But then he declares... In amity, one man can make a difference. In this case, though, he didn't. He knew there was still a problem. He felt it. His instincts told him that. But he didn't go along with it, and now a child is dead. We have spent a lot of time following Brody and see that he is a good man and know why he did what he did. So we might be inclined to cut him the slack that he won't cut himself. But Spielberg doesn't do anything to try to mitigate this. He allows the accusation against Brody to otherwise go unchallenged instead of saving the hero's virtue. Matt Hooper comes by the Brody house later on. It's interesting that he does so, since Hooper seems like the poster child for the rich college kid who would throw rocks at the police while protesting Vietnam and shouting, All cops are pigs! 
but seeing Brody's reaction to Mrs. Kittner is likely all that is needed to see this is the best ally that he can find on the island to deal with the shark that he suspects is still here. He watches as Brody swills the probably very expensive wine he's brought over, not trying to further push him down, but making clear to Ellen Brody that he is certain the shark responsible has not been caught. The unstated implication, there are more people who could potentially die if Brody repeats his mistake and doesn't take action. And it does work, as Brody soon decides that they'll cut open the shark to prove or disprove whether or not it's the one they want. Of course, it isn't, so they use Hooper's boat to search for the shark, coming across the remains of Ben Gardner's boat, and soon Gardner himself. But more importantly is the brief realization that this was done by a great white, before Hooper drops the tooth in panic. The next morning, the pair of them try explaining this to Vaughn, but he is understandably resistant. After all, look at this from his point of view. All they have is a wrecked boat with a dead fisherman on it. Martin Brody is emotionally compromised because they made the wrong call about the shark, and Matt Hooper has been insisting this whole time that they still have a shark problem when it seemed that it has finally gone away, and any mistakes jeopardize the financial future of this town. Vaughn isn't blindly ignoring evidence, after all. The only sign we have of damage to Ben Gardner's body is a missing eye, and obviously the shark didn't do that. So he just says that if they're worried about the beaches, then make sure that they're safe. So we see Brody and Hooper marshalling forces to do that in time for the big 4th of July tomorrow. Uh, Incidentally, the Killer Shark video game we see one of the kids playing, that's real. It wasn't made for the film, although it's actually an electromechanical game, not a video game. It uses a series of projected images rather than generated graphics just in case you were curious about it like I was. Things take an unfortunate turn. First, when a pair of kids set off a false alarm that causes a stampede, and at least one person is seriously hurt. But the other is how close to home it strikes for Brody himself, as his son is sailing, at Brody's prompting, in an area that's called the Pond, which should be much safer. The shark has killed only two people, remember with less time spent with the second victim than the first, and the time stalking much shorter as well. The next will be even less. But first, it should be noted how the soundtrack handles it. Silence for the false alarm, but playing for the real thing, as Brody goes to check out the cries from a girl on the beach who's yelling shark. The music's been fairly honest. The only time it was there when there was no shark was after Ben Gardner was found dead. And even that could be argued to show that the film was showing the shark was responsible for this, and highlighting the terror that it represents. It can be forgiven. But the real shark strikes now, taking out a guy we've seen only for seconds before he's knocked into the water, along with Michael and his friends. But only the guy in the rowboat is eaten. Michael is left in shock after what he has witnessed and is taken to the hospital. This strikes close to home for Brody and combined with the fact that every possible effort was arranged to try to avoid this and they still couldn't keep people safe, makes clear that killing the shark is the only possible answer now. So Brody goes to Mayor Vaughn, who is currently babbling to himself about acting in the town's best interest, babbling about August, saving them financially that way. But when Brody confronts him, we realize that his babble is actually covering up something far more than his political career. Actually, to him, it would be more comforting to face a political disaster than to confront the ugly truth. Not that he was wrong about the shark, but that his own kids had been out there. His own children could have been the victim because of his decision. By now, many of you are likely saying, come on, how can you keep defending this guy when you say this story is about Brody's guilt? This guy is just as much as responsible for Alex Kittner, plus the guy in the rowboat. Well, the reason why is because many of the copycat works out there have the Mayor Vaughn character as just this unreasonable, pig-headed idiot who almost seems to want people to get killed by monsters. I think it's important to show the original is not that way at all. He's just a man who couldn't see what he didn't want to see until it struck close to home. Oh, don't get me wrong. He is absolutely responsible for these deaths. 
He should absolutely be held to account, and he should carry even more guilt than Brody does. Brody was responsible for the death of Alex Kittner. Mayor Vaughn is responsible for his death and the guy in the rowboat, too. I just think it's important to note that this character with this small of a role still has more aspects to him than many similar characters in other works, including to what we're going to get throughout this summer here. The fact of the matter is, he's responsible, but he handles it like a human being does, and he makes a fallible human mistake. That's the key to take away here. Not that Mayor Vaughn was innocent, but rather that Mayor Vaughn acts like a believable person. This brings the story of the first hour to its conclusion, as Brody, who bent before the pressure of the town leadership, is now here making demands and refuses to take no for an answer. The working class guy stepping up now to finally make the powers that be do what they should have done in the first place. This man made yours. Are you kidding? Who's kidding who around here? This is a dark day in Hollywood. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> shining, this is a very this is dark, a dark day. day for our pal. The greatest <laughs> picture of all time was made and they haven't recognized the, the director. director. Who made it? The shark? The second half is now very different. In the first, it's about events. In the second, it's about action. That's not to say that this section is an action piece. What I mean is that the first part was all about different times and places and people, compressed down to an hour. In essence, all of it leading us up to here. Now, there's only one thing. Killing the shark. Things happen, but practically every event is about that. So it's more like a series of stages. So stage one is the hunt, during which Quint does his very best to verbally torment the other two, singing pirate songs and sharing old naval jokes with Brody as they take a man terrified of the water out to sea, and commenting on all of Hooper's scientific apparatus instead of the practical equipment that he prefers. When Hooper rebukes Brody for pulling the wrong line and spilling his stuff everywhere, including potentially explosive tanks, Quint chastises him for bringing something he implies is expensive but useless. But then, in a voice that Hooper can't hear, likewise makes clear to Brody not to screw up like that again. Quint and Hooper are both experts, but neither wants to admit their expertise of the other. This becomes quite clear when Quint first gets a bite on his fishing pole, and while Quint is convinced that it's the shark, Hooper is sure that this is just some game fish, and makes that clear, until he literally falls on his ass, and we discover that whatever was on the line was strong enough to bite through piano wire. In the face of Quint's gloating, Hooper refuses to concede the point, to which Quint compounds the point of Hooper being wrong by pointing out he won't even admit to being wrong. Hooper can only make obscene gestures because, as infuriating as it might be, Quint was right on both points, much to Hooper's extreme annoyance. It's one thing to be wrong, but to be called out by someone acting arrogant who is so clearly lacking in education and looks at Hooper as a spoiled rich kid, it's gotta be infuriating. The shark is soon revealed, without the music, catching the audience off guard and setting up for the famous improv, you're going to need a bigger boat. Although it's been alleged that the phrase itself was an inside joke among the cast and crew about the stinginess of production. The music then begins to establish, oh yes, this is the real McCoy here, which Quint asserts is 25 feet long, a record-setting size for a great white though the real-life great white deep blue is a close challenger, and she has limited her diet to seals and whales rather than to swimmers. That's why I refer to the shark as a monster. It's clearly a horror movie monster in its extreme size, aggressiveness, and willingness to hunt humans. I mean, we all know the statistics, although the coconut one that's often repeated is an urban legend that pulled the stat out of thin air. But I admit, I don't want to be a statistic. Because the rare does happen. You are dealing in the end with wild animals, and wild animals are unpredictable, so I prefer to admire sharks from very far away. So we've now entered stage two, fighting the monster. Quinn's plan is to shoot it with harpoons tied to barrels, allow the barrels to tire out the shark so that Quint can then finish it off. Hooper is more interested in scientific analysis, between taking pictures and using his equipment, rather than tying the barrels to the harpoon, so Quint gets a less-than-ideal shot. 
But they have something on the new shark. The buoyancy is going to tire it out and draw the shark up to the surface, so they'll be staying in this area. This offers a bit of downtime for them now, after all the excitement and the terror that we've experienced. Give the audience a chance to breathe, and for a drunken Quentin Hooper to put aside their differences for a little while in the comparison of their scars. We couldn't find two more different men, but they're united by their love of the sea and interest in sharks. It's at this time that the famous Indianapolis speech is given, worked and reworked and reworked again by Shaw himself, who was also a writer. The speech is a powerful tale of how the USS Indianapolis, flagship of the 5th Fleet that delivered the uranium core for the Hiroshima bomb, was then sunk and the crew abandoned to the sea for days. Contrary to the speech, a distress signal was sent, but the sinking ship was unable to send a confirmation signal when that was received, and so it was disregarded. Quinn tells the horror of being trapped and helpless, while in reality, most deaths were down to environment, or, understandably, to madness. But Quint tells the tale of sharks picking sailors off left and right. The speech is not only a tour de force, but an absolutely vital piece of characterization, which contrasts nicely with Hooper's. Hooper told the tale of his first interest in sharks, being about one that took his boat apart, and while he was terrified, he was also fascinated. For him, sharks were these amazing primal creatures, but for Quint, they are a nightmare with fins. They are the embodiment of all his fears and hatreds, an enemy that he fights and conquers time and again. This helps us get the madness that will overtake Quint once this begins. Now that we're into stage three, the monster strikes back. It starts with the shark attacking the boat, battering it, until finally it begins to take on so much water the generator shuts down. And Quint responds by heading out and shooting at the shark with a rifle. A pointless gesture of frustration, although it does establish that there is a rifle on board for the climactic scene. Incidentally, while Quint is shooting at the shark, you can now see the blinking light on the side of the barrel, indicating what Hooper had been getting up to. That little device that he had that looked kind of like a small roll-on deodorant, that is some kind of a tracking device. What he'd done is he'd run back inside to grab that so he could attach it to the barrel, presumably in case it got away from them. They could then track it that way. Remember, Hooper isn't out here out of pure altruism. He's here because he has a scientific interest in the shark, and is so taking steps to try to pursue this from a scientific method. Sometimes it just happens to clash with Quint's more thuggish approach. The following morning during repairs, the shark returns, and when Quint tries to deal with it, his hands are sliced open by a rope. When Brody goes to call for help, Quint heads inside and smashes the radio with a bat to ensure that no one else can interfere. This isn't just any shark now. This is the shark. It's one thing to say that Quint is Captain Ahab, but it's quite another to have a seemingly otherwise sane man pour every bit of hatred and fear into one animal and being prepared to risk everything to vanquish it. The boat is still not repaired from the damage the night before, but Quint puts a harpoon and barrel into the shark, followed by another but Hooper warns that there are limits to their pursuit because of the damage to the engine. Fortunately, keeping up is not a problem yet, and with both lines tied to the boat cleats, everything seems to be going to Quint's plan. Except the plan isn't enough for a monster shark. His attempt to tow in the shark only gets his cleats pulled right out of the transom, and a third barrel is insufficient to stop the shark from being able to descend. Having been foiled at every turn, Quint heads towards land, claiming that he's going to drown the shark this way. Based on what he does, his reasoning might be that if he can get the shark to chase them fast enough, it won't realize the water is too shallow for it until it's too late. So he pushes hard, much too hard for the engine in that state, and soon it burns out and the boat is left adrift. This brings us into stage four, the final stage. The orca is nothing more than an elaborate raft now, its inhabitants doomed to either a slow death from dehydration or a fast, unpleasant death via shark. Realizing that he's exhausted every option, Quint finally turns to Hooper, 
who under the circumstances doesn't gloat about being the one who's right now. Instead, he gets straight to it. Poisoning. His decision to bring this stuff along suggests that this had been Hooper's hope the entire time. He had earlier mentioned to Quint that he had brought things that could kill a shark. And unlike Quint's approach, these would leave the body completely intact for scientific study. They assemble his anti-shark cage, and Hooper suits up to go inside to try to jab the shark with the poisoned spear. During the setup, Quint has set up two air tanks on the table in the cabin. More on that in a moment. Hooper himself is so afraid of the shark, though, that despite his outburst at Brody, no doubt is aware that this cage is not going to be able to stand up to the monster that they're facing. In fact, he's so terrified that he can't spit in his mask. The thought of it is leaving his mouth dry. So far the action has happened on the surface, but the cage finally brings it down into the world where the shark is the undisputed master. Interestingly, as it approaches, the shark looks very much like the video game from earlier until it gets close enough to pass and we can truly grasp the enormity of it. Its first attack from behind Hooper causes him to lose the spear, and now the shark struggles to rip the cage open to get him. He strikes at the shark with a knife, but to no avail. It will not be driven off. In fact, the original intention was for Hooper to be eaten, as in the novel, but an accident where a live great white got caught in the cage's line inspired Spielberg to change it so that he could use that footage. With man going into the realm of shark and failing, now the shark is going into the realm of man, breaching the surface to land on the boat, its enormous weight destroying the already wounded craft. The second tank on the table rolls on Quint's hand, causing him to lose his grip and slide helplessly into biting range of the shark, a far more tragic end compared with the Moby Dick-style death that the novel gave him, since death by shark is clearly Quint's greatest fear. With Quint dead and Hooper presumed dead, actually hiding on the ocean floor, Brody is the one who is left, leaving clear just how insurmountable a task he is attempting. Two different shark experts, two men who knew everything about the ocean, are already defeated. While this can be seen as some symbolism, the truth is it just shows how desperate the situation is for a man who has neither the experience of them nor is he comfortable with the ocean. He's a man terrified of drowning, now alone, on a boat that is most definitely going to sink. The novel ends a bit anticlimactically, with the shark dying in the end, thanks to all the damage that Quint had done finally catching up with it. But much to the annoyance of author Peter Benchley, whom Spielberg eventually threw off and barred from the set, Brody was going to defeat the shark. This, incidentally, was what made Spielberg cast the unknown Roy Scheider over the studio pick, Charlton Heston, because Heston was so well known and had recently appeared in several heroic roles for Universal that the audience would expect him to be the hero, rather than Scheider's Brody, who cowers after he throws the second tank into the shark's mouth. It's been alleged that this slight is the reason Charlton Heston refused to appear in any of Spielberg's films. Going back to the second tank, I have to wonder if perhaps there was something more going on to what we were seeing. After all, we know that only Hooper was going to go down there. There was no reason for Quint to set up a second tank, yet we clearly saw that he had two in there on the table. Why would he do that? Maybe it explains what happens in the climax of the film. That, while Hooper was finishing getting ready, Quint was in there prepping the second tank with some stuff that he might have had around, perhaps flares or something, to enhance it so that he could turn the tank into an IED to be used against the shark if the poisoning plan failed. It would help explain why we get a much larger explosion out of the air tank than what we should normally expect. But nevertheless, when Brody finally ruptures the tank with Quint's rifle and blows the shark's head clean off, the day has been saved, and he and Hooper are free to head back to shore safely leaving everyone with a happy ending that, in fact, they stayed until the very end of so that they could applaud it again, given how unusual this was for its time. Not even special effects? Not even special effects? Oh. Oh. This is called commercial backlash. Right. I don't know if anybody knows the word commercial backlash, no. but when a, film, when a film makes a lot of money, people resent it. Everybody, they do. everybody loves a winner, right. but nobody loves a winner. 
I am merely the latest in a long string of people to talk about JAWS on everything from social examination to gender studies, its implications for both cinema and for sharks. But what has prompted me to do this is to show us the young Steven Spielberg at this early point, so early, in fact, that much of the film's success at this time was actually given not to him, but to the editor, Verna Fields. Fields, incidentally, introduced Steven's friend George Lucas to Marcia since they were both involved in film editing. Fields certainly does an admirable job on the film, but Spielberg was naturally bothered after the grueling shoot, a shoot that was so awful he actually ducked out early because he'd heard the crew was plotting terrible revenge for him when the film was finished. So Spielberg worked with a different editor for his next three films. Uh, she passed away in the early 80s. His successes with Close Encounters, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and E.T. confirmed that his role in Jaws' success was much larger than he had originally been given credit for, and his approach transformed movies. His decision to give a rousing, explosive ending showed he understood what it was that audiences wanted to see, correctly predicting that they would follow him to the end even if it was implausible to have a shark bite down on a tank. Seeing what he did provides context for next month when I do one of my more typical styles of reviews with the next Steven Spielberg man-eater film, Jurassic Park. Seeing what he did here, how he approached creating a genuinely great film out of what in a lesser director's hands would have been forgettable, will help us to see better the decisions that he made on that movie. So next month we trade shark terrorizing an island for dinosaurs terrorizing an island. Hope to see you then.